Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Please find a seat. We have some seats uh, spread out uh, throughout the, um, the rows. We also have some more chairs in the back. If we run out, we can set up some additional ones. I don't know how many of you plan events, but the greatest pleasure is to have to set out more chairs. So thank you for making that possible. Thank you also for braving the little bit of unpleasant weather that has marred an otherwise gorgeous November so far. Fingers crossed that that continues, but um, especially for a topic um, like we have tonight. I'm very excited to hear from the amazing speakers that we have brought for, for the discussion tonight. And I appreciate you all being here to join us for it. As you know, we're here because 77 years ago on this day, mobs of German, Austrian, and Czech soldiers, police officers, ideological troops, secret police, civilians, stormed through Jewish homes, businesses, synagogues, workplaces, looting, smashing, burning, and arresting. On this night, 77 years ago, nearly 40,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent ultimately to concentration camps where many of them stayed for several months. On this night, 77 years ago, many young children discovered for the first time the kind of rabid anti-Semitic hate that their families had successfully sheltered them from up until this point. On this night, 77 years ago, Many Jews who thought that Hitler and Nazism was a passing thing discovered in no uncertain terms that it was not, that things were only bound to get worse. For this Kristallnacht event, we took an, un uh, not unusual, a unique approach, and I'd like to explain it to you so you'll understand how we convened our panel. We thought about what is it that Kristallnacht means in the history of the Holocaust, not just in the historical unfolding of a path that we now know ultimately led to extermination, although it was not really in the works yet in 1938 during Kristallnacht. What is it that it meant? to the Jews? What is it that it meant to the Nazis? What is it that it meant to the world? And what we came up with as we thought about it was that Kristallnacht was the moment that changed everything. For the Jews of Germany, Austria, and parts of the Czech Republic, it was the moment after which there could no longer be any doubt of Hitler's intentions. It's the moment at which Jews who had had since 1933 five years to think through and plan their emigration, their flight from Germany, but had chosen not to for a variety of reasons, began to implement those plans. In 1938, from January until November, 18,000 Jews left Germany. In the next 12 months, over 100,000 Jews did. This was the moment, as we say, that changed everything. I, t I take a little concept from physics for a moment because it seems to encapsulate what we're trying to say so well. Um, it's, it's a little far afield. It comes from um, the physics of black holes. Maybe it's not that far afield. But in the physics of space, they have a concept called the event horizon. And the event horizon is defined as the point of no return. 
the point at which the gravitational pull becomes so great as to make escape impossible. Luckily, escape was still possible for some Jews in this case, but the path towards the trains, the path towards the concentration camps, and the paths towards murder were inexorably opened and cleared. So tonight, taking the concept of the moment that changed everything, we invited survivors, obviously, of the Holocaust, but also survivors of the genocide in Rwanda and the genocide in Srebrenica to help us see that same moment in other contexts, in other genocides, with other victims and with other perpetrators. Because we know that Kristallnacht happened in a very particular context, in a very particular time, in a very particular place. But the horrors of genocide were not limited to those geographical parameters, and in fact, are ongoing today. So, <clears throat> I'd like to thank you all, as I said, for coming, and welcome to the Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center and Archives at Queensborough Community College. It's our honor to host you tonight. My name is Dr. Dan Lesham, and I'm the director. I'd like now to acknowledge and introduce you to a couple of our local elected officials who not only support us and our programming throughout the year, but take time out of their busy schedule to join us. It's truly our honor to host them. I'd like to invite up first Assemblyman David Weprin. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, as Dan uh, correctly pointed out, the historical perspective uh, of Kristallnacht, which is really um, given um, I wouldn't, I'm not going to use the word credit, but uh, being the um, event that uh, people talk about uh, starting the beginning of the Holocaust. And, uh, you know, and obviously it went uh, downhill from there. Um, and I wish I could say that, um, you know, more than 75 years, uh, you know, 77 years uh, since uh, Kristallnacht, that uh, we no longer have uh, anti-Semitism or hate uh, in general uh, anywhere. But it, unfortunately, I can't even say that we don't even have uh, hate right here in Queens. You know, Queens is the most uh, diverse county uh, probably in the entire world. You know, over you know, 200 countries of origin. Uh, this particular college is particularly represented uh, by the diversity of Queens, and, and that's a good thing. Our strength is in our diversity. But unfortunately, we see hate from time to time rearing its ugly head. Uh, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, anti-Semitism uh, as, you know, reflected by swastikas and, uh, and other types of assault. Uh, many have occurred in Brooklyn, many in Queens as well. Uh, but we also have uh, anti-Asian discrimination. We have a very large Asian population, anti-South Asian discrimination. Um, anti-African-American, anti-Latino, and it, it's not, you don't see it all the time, but every so often, you know, uh, it rears its ugly head. And it's so important that we all, uh, as people of goodwill, uh, come together whenever there's one of these uh, hate incidents. And, uh, you know, a hate crime against uh, one individual, a group, one day uh, could be a hate crime against another group. and. Um, it's like that famous uh, Martin Bober uh, comment, uh, you know, first they came for this group, then they came for that group, and then finally there was nobody left to speak up. So um, it, it's so important, you know, that we really all stay vigilant uh, and speak out uh, at the very beginning uh, of any hate incident or any discriminatory speech and let people know that that's not okay. You know, yes, I am offended uh, by that joke or I am offended by that remark, uh, and, uh, and hopefully will prevent uh, any uh, future occurrence, and uh, it's very important that we remember, and that's what, uh, you know, commemorations like Kristallnacht uh, are so important for, uh, as well as Yom HaShoah, to uh, remember, because, um, you know, if we don't remember, uh, you know, we could repeat history, and of course, uh, nobody wants that, and that's, not going to happen, hopefully, but you know it's so important that we remember and speak out 
Uh, and um, just remember that it may not be a hate crime against your group or your family, uh, but it could be, you know, in a later date, uh, one of those. So it's so important that we really uh, stand united uh, and speak out against uh, hate crimes uh, wherever they rear their ugly head. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you so much, Assemblyman Webbrin. I'd like now to introduce our newly elected city council member from District 23, Barry Gordenchik. Thank you so much for coming. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for pronouncing my name so, so correctly. I went to my first stated meeting today. I'm, I'm not officially in office yet. Uh, it'll be another couple of weeks till my election is certified, so I'll probably be at the next stated meeting. Uh, representing the people of this community, uh, Queensboro Community College, you know, the, all of the colleges uh, in my district. Um, I've read so much about the Holocaust and about Kristallnacht, and I very, very rarely get to speak about it. Um, I am not a direct survivor, but um, in conversations I had with my late mother, um, we are the only branch of our family that is still alive, and, and one of my uh, late grandmother's sisters also made it to England in the early part of the last century, but everybody else um, was killed. And that's a burden that um, I live with. It's a burden um, because it's up to me and to everybody here to bear witness. We live in an age where it is seemingly acceptable not only uh, for people to deny the Holocaust, but for the heads of state of countries, large countries, uh, to deny the Holocaust and to deny other uh, forms of genocide which have taken place in the last several decades. So we here in Queens, and David touched on it, we are the home place, the birthplace of tolerance in the new world. I talk about quite often, I was honored to serve as the vice president on the board of the Bound House Historical Society. John Bound, uh, we all know his name. He allowed the Quakers to preach, which was a revolutionary act in 1660 in Queens. It wasn't even a Queens County. It was just uh, the village of Lissingen uh, before the name was anglicized. But that act of courage uh, redounds down through the centuries. It's over three and a half centuries ago. And we have a special legacy that I take very seriously. I know David takes very seriously as elected officials in this county to stand up every single time, not once a year or twice a year, but whenever we have to, whether it's here at this wonderful resource center uh, where people come to study from all over the world to learn about the Holocaust and other acts of genocide, um, but whenever and wherever we can, and we've all been at those vigils, those commemorating victims of hate here in Queens and other parts of New York City. But I want to thank the Holocaust Center this evening um, for bringing together such, and I call you August. Are you old enough to be August? I don't know what, what, the, what the age. You're, you, uh, you're not August, and she's not August. I'll say to bringing together these survivors. Um, my cousin Henry is married to the daughter of a, a survivor of Kristallnacht. They left the next day. They literally left Germany uh, the next day, and they went to Palestine, where my cousin's wife was born. Um, and then she emigrated here and met my cousin. Um, but I want to thank you for being here tonight. I want to thank Dr. Dan uh, for hosting. And I look forward. I haven't done anything yet here. I've been here, but you know we do have a lot of capital money in the city council. So just to oh, see, he got to know. I just want to. I wanted to give him a uh, a heads up. And I know David was generous when he was in the council. And I plan to be so here also at Queensboro and specifically at the Holocaust Resource Center. Thank you and God bless you all. Good to know. Uh, thank you so much. We also received regards from Assemblyman Ed Bronstein, who had hoped to be here, but uh, he's got babysitting duty tonight with his newborn, so we wish him all the best and the greatest happiness. So, I'd like now to introduce you to our first speaker. Um, it's truly an honor as Hannah Liebman has been a volunteer here. In addition to being a survivor who speaks to groups here year after year, she's also been a volunteer for a very long time here at the center. 
She's also on our advisory board. We have several advisory board members here in the audience tonight, but only one of them up on the stage. Um, she is a true force of nature and a wonderful woman. Um, and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about her background. Hannah was born in Germany. She was 14 years old on the evening of Kristallnacht. She was 16 when she was deported in October of 1940 and the family was taken to the Gors concentration camp in southern France. In September 1941, the Children's Aid Society rescued her and six other teenagers from the camp. They were hidden in the children's home in the village of Le Chambon sur Lignon. In 1943, with false papers, she escaped to Switzerland. She married the man to whom she is still married today. Yep. Um, and in 1948, immigrated to the US with her husband and infant daughter. She's been sharing her experiences for more than 25 years. Please join me in welcoming Hannah Lieben. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It is a bit of my own experience that I'm telling you about and history. And you have in your hands the order that went out on November 10, 1938, to the party members of what they should do and what they should not do. And how did it come about? On November 2nd, 7th, 1938, a young Herschel Greenspan, living and studying in Paris, was in a state of total desperation when he learned that his parents, together with all Polish Jews living in Germany, were expelled and taken to the Polish border. He managed to get a gun and went to the German embassy. With the idea, with the intent to shoot in the German ambassador. At the embassy, he was referred instead to the embassy counsel Ernst von Rath, whom he shot and who died on November 9, 1938. The Nazis used this murder to unlock a long planned program against the Jews in Germany and Austria and Czechoslovakia. With the Nazis, November 1038, which the Nazis called Kristallnacht, for all the glass they broke, we commemorate this day today. You have in your hand an order which went out very early on November 1038 with instructions that should happen and what not. No one was to be in uniform so that the foreign press had the impression that it was the people who reacted with fury against the murder. It was not. 30,000 men, Dr. Leshem just said 40, right? They are arrested, okay, 40,000. They are arrested and sent to concentration camps. 100 died that day due to beatings, heart attacks, or suicide. A good number of Jews had left Germany but others felt the regime could not survive and hoped they could tough it out. This day told all of, of us otherwise. Jewish businesses and apartments were vandalized and furniture thrown out the windows into the street. Synagogues set on fire are otherwise destroyed. Prayer books burned or otherwise made unusable. I myself went to school as always at 7.45 in the morning and saw a fire truck standing in the street close to the Orthodox synagogue. As I entered the classroom at the Jewish secular school, I found my classmates in tears. When I asked why, they looked at me and said, don't you know our fathers have been arrested and taken away? Now, in my family, my mother was a widow, so there was no man in the house and so they did not come to our apartment or to our photo studio. Um, sure enough, one of, none of our male teachers were present, only the female ones. 
dismissed at 10 a.m., I found out what happened. Now, since all the male teachers were not in school, couldn't be arrested, and there were only the ladies, and there were only two or three, and a school full of children, what do you do? Today I understand, but at that time I did not. And one of the teachers came into the classroom and said, I want you to write an essay about your summer vacation. And so I started, I think, two or three sentences. And then I figured, this is really stupid and ridiculous. Closed my book, forget it. <laughs> we were dismissed at 10 o'clock. I found out what happened. The store next to where I lived was sent selling oriental rugs, the name of the people was Dreyfus. They had been vandalized and full of ink. A few steps further, I found my mother sweeping the street to remove the glass charts from our showcases. When I told her I wanted to do it, she said no, and told me to go upstairs. She was afraid I could be hurt. By the way, there was a whole bunch of people watching her. It was, to say the least, a horrible day and left us all in shock. All Jewish business had to be closed by December 31st, 38. The government imposed a one billion marks fine on the Jewish communities to, fo to hold the insurance companies harmless for all the money they had to pay out for the damages their insured had suffered. In other words, we had to pay for the damages. Okay? It was a difficult situation for the German Jews, with no many already impoverished. Now there are no businesses, there are no jobs, and the synagogue I belonged to at the time was severely damaged and had to be torn down. The real estate was eventually sold and the money that the community got was used to feed the people who no longer could feed themselves. This is the point that the community can reach. I'm not saying there were still people who could take care of themselves, but many could not. It was a terrible situation. Everyone wanted now, everybody wants to get out. Now everybody realizes it. you cannot tough it out. And the urgency was horrendous. Yet, I'm asking you, what country was willing to take us? America had called for a conference of 32 governments, 32 countries, to decide what could be done about the Jewish question. America, who by the way had called for that conference in France, and did not budge from the quota that already existed. Okay, 27,000 people a year. You have maybe 150,000 or 100,000 people who want to come to America. Imagine how long it would take before they were called to the consulate to get their papers provided they had someone here who gave them an affidavit. It was a desperate situation, absolutely desperate. Quite aside from all the chicanery the government gave us or made to make it more difficult. Eventually, people could leave with 10 marks in their pockets, which was two and a half dollars. 10 marks a person. So if you were a family of four, you arrived here with $10. What do you do? The situation became desperate. And we, even so we were young, understood it very well. People moved together in order to save on rent and all sorts of things. In any case, it was a difficult situation for the German Jews with so many already impoverished, as I mentioned. But little did we know what was ahead of us. And what was ahead of us is on the last page 
of the papers I gave you. I thank you. Next week. Thank, thank you so much, Hannah. I just wanted to elaborate since I was just doing the research 1939 was the first year that the quota for immigration to the U.S. was filled. So even though the quota was 27,000, um, the American administration told its consular offices to make the process as difficult as possible, so hopefully not to fill the 27,000 slots. 1939 was the first year that it was filled, and the German slot, since now the Germans controlled Austria and parts of Czech Republic, the whole area now was 27,000. 309,000 Jews applied. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I would like now to introduce, as our third speaker um, is this coming in the door, I'd like now to introduce you to Jacqueline Murakatete. She was born in Rwanda. She was nine years old in 1994, April 7th, when the genocide in Rwanda started. She lost her parents and her siblings and most of her extended family during the following 100 days. In about 100 days, around 1 million people were killed in Rwanda. The most amazing thing for me about Jacqueline's story is that uh, she was first inspired to start sharing her story when a Holocaust survivor, late Holocaust survivor named David Gewurzman came to her high school and shared his story of the Holocaust. And from what I understand, it resonated with you, and you wrote to him afterwards, um, and essentially said something to the effect of, you know, I think I might be a survivor too, um, which is incredibly moving, the connections between the work we do on the Holocaust and how survivors of other genocides come and communities of other genocides come to commemorate their experiences, to, to educate their children. There's a great deal of interconnection and a lot that can be learned from different communities. And so it's really my pleasure to introduce Jacqueline and to say that since the genocide, Jacqueline came to the US where, as I mentioned, she went to high school. She also got a law degree here in New York City and has just recently started, I think, your second or your first official nonprofit called the Genocide Survivors Network, where she's working with other survivors of the Rwandan genocide. Um, so please join me in welcoming Jacqueline Marekatete and Arisada. Please join us. Um, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to begin by saying what an honor it is for me to be here uh, this evening. Uh, over the years, I've had a number of opportunities to work with um, Holocaust survivors. Uh, as you heard from Dan, I was actually inspired uh, to share my story for the first time by a Holocaust survivor who came to speak to uh, my English class here in Queens Village, actually, um, uh, that was uh, taught by a uh, a wonderful teacher, Miss Elisa Gold, uh, Goldstein, and um, I know her uh, partner is here in the room. And um, over the years, I've had opportunities to work with a number of Holocaust survivors because I, like them, believe that it's very important, as you heard, for us to uh, to remember, but also to uh, remember in a way that moves us to action, to make sure that uh, the never again that was uh, promised uh, after the Holocaust uh, is something that can move from being uh, words to actually being reality for uh, for uh, all mankind, and that's the type of work that I focus my uh, my time on now is trying to make sure uh, that the never again becomes a reality. So, like the Holocaust uh, and other genocides that have followed uh, the Holocaust, the 1994 genocide uh, in my native country of Rwanda. Uh, did not rise in a vacuum. Uh, this genocide was uh, preceded by many years of uh, state-sanctioned discrimination against uh, ethnic Tutsis, 
who are the ethnic minority uh, in Rwanda. So growing up in Rwanda, I was aware that I was born in a country where my family, uh, for the only reason of being Tutsis, were treated uh, more or less as second uh, class citizens. And the genocide was also preceded by many years of uh, indoctrination uh, where the government, the Hutu-led government, would op openly indoctrinate Hutu children uh, in anti-Tutsi propaganda. Uh, the genocide was also uh, preceded by uh, a dehumanization campaign, as was the Holocaust, as you are all familiar. And finally, it was preceded by a cultural impunity. Uh, Rwanda, prior to April of 1994, had, come, uh, had become a country or uh, an environment where uh, Hutus, who are the majority ethnic group, felt that any time the government asked them to quote unquote do their job, which in Rwanda meant killing their Tutsi neighbors, uh, Hutus had uh, willingly participated. So growing up as a child, even prior to 1994, I grew up with stories of massacres of Tutsis in 1959, in 1960s, in 1970s. Uh, my parents and my grandparents used to tell me about many days when they used to go to hide uh, in bushes for, uh, for, for a long time uh, because they were being hunted down by um, their Hutu neighbors. But despite this history and this uh, series of events and this campaign uh, of, of discrimination that preceded the genocide, I have to say that up until 1994, as a child who was at the time nine years old, I never really imagined that such thing as um, the evil which occurred in Rwanda in 1994 would ever happen in my own lifetime. Yes, I, I was aware of past history, but myself and my siblings and um, other young people like myself believe that um, things were going to be different for us. But uh, things changed dramatically uh, beginning on April 6th of 1994. And I think that uh, although, as I mentioned, there were a series of events leading up to the genocide, although there was a lot of planning uh, on a part of the government by the genocide, I mean, it is now uh, documented that the government had imported machetes, for example, years before 1994. And they had imported those machetes not for agricultural use, but because they knew that they uh, would use them. The government wanted to use the machetes uh, in the killing. And it is also well documented that the government trained a lot of Hutu uh, militias and Hutu youth. So the government was, I mean, the, the genocide was very well planned, and that's why the killings ended up being uh, very, uh, very efficient. But for, uh, for me as a child, and I think for many other children at the time, uh, the time or the moment when we actually realized that a genocide was about to begin, it was on the morning of April 7th, uh, 1994. Because the night before, on the night of April 6th, 1994, uh, the then president of Rwanda, um, uh, his plan was shut down on his way to the capital city of Rwanda, on his way to Kigali, and he died as a result. So on the morning of April 7, we got up to the news that the president had been killed. And the Hutu government that had pl been planning this genocide for years um, really began then using this uh, president's death as an excuse to carry out the genocide, as an excuse to begin implementing the killings that they had been carrying out, organizing and planning uh, for years. So on the morning of April 7th, I woke up and I could see that uh, my father, who had just listened um, on the radio that the president had been killed, I could see how distraught and how scared that he and my mother and all the other Tutsis in my village, I could see how um, scared they were, because at that point, immediately after the death of the president was announced, we also began hearing on the national radio as Hutu extremists began calling for the extermination of Tutsis. At this point, it was no longer, uh, they, they were not vague about it. They started saying that the Tutsis, they started blaming uh, the Tutsis uh, for the death of the president, although there was no evidence. 
uh, to show that that was the case. Even today, there's no evidence. But they used the death of the president as an excuse again to implement the killing. So within hours after his, uh, his death, we began hearing Hutu extremists on the radio encouraging and calling on Hutu civilians all over the country men, women, and children to pick up machetes, to pick up clubs, to pick up spears, holes, any other instrument that they use you know, for farming generally. They started encouraging them to pick up these machetes and these instruments and to go and quote unquote do their work, which as I mentioned, this was a euphemism that was known in Rwanda to kill Tutsis. And within hours, Tutsi homes began to be burned. Tutsi men, women, and children be began to be uh, killed, and it became clear to my family and others in our village uh, that uh, we would have to flee if we had any chances of surviving. Uh, of course, then the problem became where to go, because one of the things that the government did immediately uh, was to ask the roadblocks be placed throughout Rwanda, and that anybody who attempted to go anywhere carry their ID card. Growing up in Rwanda, we all had ethnic-based ID cards. So when you pass a roadblock and you're identified as a Tutsi, you're immediately taken aside. If you're lucky, you're shot. But in most cases, you are brutally murdered uh, with machetes and, and clubs. My story of survival is a very long one, and we'll probably uh, perhaps get into it later during our panel uh, discussion. But in the, in the days following the death of the president, uh, myself and all the other Tutsi children found ourselves in an environment where we uh, witnessed uh, horrors that no other child should ever have to experience, seeing men, women, and children being murdered simply because of, uh, of who they were, uh, leaving and hiding, and waking up not knowing whether we were going to, uh, to live uh, to see the next day. And as you heard from the den, from then I was one of the few who survived. Uh, but neither my parents uh, nor my six siblings or other members of my extended family uh, were as fortunate. After the genocide, I learned that my own immediate family had been taken uh, to uh, a nearby river by my Hutu neighbors, by people whose children I grew up uh, going to school with and going to churches with. Uh, they had been taken to this river and uh, murdered one by one uh, for no other reason than they are Tutsi ethnicity, because in 1994 it had been made a crime to be a Tutsi. Being a crime, being a Tutsi was a crime uh, deserving of uh, of death. And the government made clear for the first time in 1994, unlike the previous massacres, that the goal at that time was extermination of all Tutsis, men, women, and children, as well as any other, uh, as well as any Hutus who were opposed to the extermination plan. So um, as we commemorate Kristen Act uh, tonight, and as we remember uh, the men, women, and children who were murdered during the Holocaust, I really uh, want us to ask ourselves why it is that this moment, whether it was Kristenak or there was the shooting down of the president in Rwanda or what we're here next, why, why that moment that changed things for us? Why that moment didn't change everything for the rest of the world? Where was the world? Why was the world so silent? Why did now more countries, as you heard, uh, sign on to take uh, refugees? And how can we make sure today uh, as people who are here and who are working with the center, how can we make sure that um, the international community reacts differently when uh, other people in other places uh, go through um, a similar moment or an experience? So I really hope that we'll be able to have that conversation, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. I hope we get to that conversation as well. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce you to our third speaker of the evening. After the third speaker, we'll have a little bit of discussion among the panelists, and then we'll open it up to questions, just to give you a sense of what's coming. Um, and I didn't get a chance to ask you, but I hope I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> Adisada Dudic? That's correct. Thank you. Um, as someone who has a non-typical last name, I always appreciate getting names Thank right. Um, Arisada was born in Bosnia and was six years old when the war broke out in her hometown of Srebrenica. 
She escaped with her pregnant mother and three sisters in the middle of the night from the town of Srebrenica as it came under attack. They traveled for nine days until they reached a refugee camp that was in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Believing the conflict would be over in a few weeks, they ultimately stayed at the camp for three years. Over 50 members of her family died in that war. Today she's an attorney and joined us by train from DC ju just this evening. So uh, we're honored to have her um, here to speak with us tonight. And uh, please, I just had. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And I do apologize for being a bit late. Um, but for the, it's an honor to be here. And thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you so much for um, extending these kinds of commemorative events to the Bosnian genocide and the, um, the particularly the Srebrenica genocide, which has been um, recognized on an international scale. But there are a lot of, lot of cases in Bosnia throughout the three-year war that could technically fall into that category, but legal action has yet to be determined on that. For those of you who um, may not be as familiar with uh, Bosnia or how the war came about, uh, following the declaration of Bosnia's independence in March of 92, um, the Serb forces, um, supported by the Serbian government, led by Slobodan Milosevic, some of you may know, um, they attacked Bosnia basically to keep the land and create a greater Serbia. The struggle that ensued um, was accompanied by an ethnic cleansing of the non-Serb population, particularly the Bosnian Muslim population in the eastern Bosnia near the border with Serbia. So once the towns and villages um, started uh, being in their hands, the Serb forces um, this was a joint effort by the military police, paramilitaries, and Serb villages in the area uh, basically applied the same pattern of violence. They would go to Muslim houses and apartments, systematically ransack and burn down those. Uh, Muslim villagers were rounding up, rounded up, captured, beaten, and killed. Men and women were separated, uh, with many of men detained in concentration camps for years. In another town in northern Bosnia, however, the Serb regime announced on the radio that it was taking over the town and the surrounding areas in April of 92. Shortly thereafter, the Serb nationalists ordered all non-Serbs to mark their houses with white flags or sheets and to wear a white armband if they left their homes. Over the, ne over the next few months, they initiated mass expulsions of an estimated 50,000 Bosnian Muslims and an estimated 25,000 people, including some women, children, and elderly, were taken to concentration camps uh, outside of the town where many were tortured or raped and more than 3,000 were killed. This town is the town of Prijedor uh, and is one of those that we are currently fighting to recognize as an act of genocide because this is clearly targeting one particular group of people with a systematic intent to exterminate them from the area. Uh, as Dan said, my family is from a small village of Osmice just outside of Srebrenica in eastern Bosnia. Um, the Serb aggression on Slovenia and Croatia in the years before were basically a confirmation that the Serbs would use force to achieve their goals in our area. And in the months before April um, of 92, Serbs were barricading Muslims traveling through the area. They were singling out Muslims in the streets and generally spreading anti-Muslim propaganda. However, on April 15, 92, my father loaded my mother, my sisters, and me onto trucks with other women and children from the village uh, in hopes of getting us as far away as possible. What I know now in conversations with my father is that this followed an instance where two Muslims were killed about three kilometers from our village and the Serb army leader nicknamed Arkan entered Srebrenica after his paramilitary group known as the Tigers butchered local Muslims in a nearby town of Bielina. 
My mom was nine months pregnant and we went to Slovenia and we stayed in Slovenia moving from one refugee camp to another for three years. We came back to Bosnia in April of uh, 95, uh, just a few months before the fall of Srebrenica and the genocide that followed. Uh, I would agree with Jacqueline and it's one of the things I wanted to point out tonight is that although we talk about these events or these moments where things just kind of the moment that changed everything. Uh, it's important to note that ethnic cleansing was not the consequence, but rather the goal of the war in Bosnia. The pro-Serb anti-Muslim rhetoric led to about 200 people dying, mostly civilians, tens of thousands of women raped and forcibly impregnated, and more than two million people displaced. The Serbs in the region used the forces of nationalism, hatred, fear, to implement a vision of an ethnically separated country. In hindsight, none of this was new. For example, in a poem that was published in 1971, titled Sarajevo, Dr. Radan Radovan Karadzic, who is today on trial at The Hague for war crimes, speaks of the, quote, city laying ablaze like a rough lump of incense wherein the haze of our awareness twists, the city implodes in latent emptiness. A stone's crimson death bespeaks the house's blood-soaked tide. Further, in October of 1991, in a telephone conversation that's since been evidenced uh, at his Hague trials, Karadzic is heard saying, quote, they will disappear. Sarajevo will be a black cauldron where 300,000 Muslims will die. They are not right in the head. It is clear to everyone it will be a real bloodbath. A few years later, he says, they should be trashed. That people would disappear from the face of the earth. They have to know that there are 20,000 armed Serbs around Sarajevo. Further, following Bosnia's call for independence in the early 92, he warned that the Muslim population will disappear in scenes of hell. Now, Karadzic's description of what would befall Sarajevo foreshadowed the nearly four years sniping and shelling of the city that would leave thousands dead. 21 years after that poem, on April 5th, 92, the Yugoslav People's Army initially, and later the Army of Republika Srpska, besieged Sarajevo until February 29th, 1996, ending only after the signing of the Dayton Peace Accords that are relevant for those of you who follow this month. Um, the siege of Sarajevo was the longest siege of a capital city in the history of mo modern warfare. So for 1,425 days, the civilian population of Sarajevo lived under a pervasive sense of terror, exactly what was intended, with snipers atop buildings making zero distinction between civilians and military targets, deliberately inflicting terror on the civilians on the ground. Karadzic described his quest to rid Bosnia of Muslims as, quote, holy war. He was a trained psychiatrist. He used psychiatric theories to create terror in the civilian populations and to incite the Serb public to violence. Most accounts of Serb fighters from the early 90s point to some kind of a crusading talk where they just jumble up ethnic, economic, and religious grievances against their Serb neighbors, claiming to be avenging a Turkish conquest of Bosnia in the 15th century and re-Christianing the, con the country. They blew up mosques and any religious monuments they encountered, no matter their historic value. Arkan's butch butchering of Bielina I spoke about earlier earned him the public, ble public blessing of one of the leading bishops in the Orthodox Church in the region. As he led his forces into Srebrenica in July of 95, the general of the Serb army, Radko Mladic, also currently on trial at The Hague, boasted into the TV camera saying, on this day, I give Srebrenica to the Serb people. The time has finally come to revenge against Turks who live in this area. Viljana Plavšić, a member of the wartime government of Republika Srpska, who was sentenced to 11 years in prison by the ICTY for inciting war crimes, also referred to Serbs as a, quote, genetically tainted material. I use these examples just to highlight that 
As Jacqueline pointed out, we must point out, uh, we must pay attention to the hateful rhetoric, as genocide does not happen in a vacuum. Unfortunately, it happens in a string of events that kind of let, lead to a major massacre. So there's always the one moment that changes everything for us, but for those of us who are lucky to look back today, we do find a long list of examples of hateful actions by that were at that time perhaps attributed to a lone madman and dismissed. But once the situation bruised to a certain, uh, bruised to a certain point where people are likely to believe it, it can end in disastrous consequences for our humanity. And I do hope that we can talk about that some more tonight. I want to first thank the three of you most sincerely and from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to come and speak with us and to share such personal and difficult stories and for such an important purpose. So first of all, thank you so much. Um, I'm very, I was very struck at some of the similarities between your stories and as I think probably most people in the audience um, might have heard more resonances. Many of us are more familiar with the story of the Holocaust, but hearing the resonances throughout the other genocides, and there were a couple of points that I really would like to pick back up on. Um, all three of you spoke about the moment that changed everything came after countless smaller moments that changed some things. Um, but sort of the, the, the full impact of it wasn't apparent yet. So they contained the grain of the bigger event, but there weren't, there, it didn't mean the same thing yet. So I'd like to ask you, <clears throat> excuse me, about some of those earlier moments, but the other thing that I'd like to ask you to consider, you're always told never to ask two questions as if it's one question, but I want to throw one more thing, and if we don't get to it, we don't get to it. Um, you were all very, very young girls, between nine and 14, at the, the big moment, and so younger still at the earlier moments. Um, so I guess I have two questions, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, one of them is to talk about what you perceived about the earlier moments that came before this moment. And number two, and maybe it's a bigger question, um, Looking back on the child that you were then, can you shed some light on us? What is it that a child understands about what's happening in situations like this? What's the younger person's experience? Um, I know, I think that you mentioned, Jacqueline, that you grow up very quickly, or Hannah, you might have mentioned it, or I might have just heard it in all of yours because it's there. But before that moment, or what do you hear and what did you understand? We heard a lot of things, and if adults think children don't understand what's going on, they are terribly wrong. Starting on April 1, 1933, with the boycott against all Jewish businesses in Germany, I understood very well that things will not be the same anymore. I don't think my mother thought I would know, but I did. We made, made, were made to behave in the street like angels. Absolutely. Don't draw attention to yourself. Be quiet. Blah, blah, blah. By 1935, we were deprived of our citizenship and civil rights. We were segregated out of society. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't go to a swimming pool or whatever you. Coffee shop? Out of the question. Restaurant? Out of the question. So we understood very well, young as we were, that there, was, there were two different worlds, one out there and the one we lived. And I had members in my family who had a chance to go to America, but the job that was offered him was not suitable, he felt. It wasn't big enough. 
And then he had an offer to go to Sweden. He felt the film industry in Sweden is really too small for him. And I stood there and said, is the man absolutely crazy? How old was I? 13 or 14? And I knew that my uncle was dead wrong. So as far as my uncle, who was in the concentration camp following uh, November 10, he was so severely beaten that when he came home four weeks later and he had an American visa in his pocket, that's why they let him go after four weeks, he had been so severely beaten that his shoulder was broken, his clavicle was broken. He came here, he had to go to Mount Sinai Hospital that had to operate in him, and it was a mess. Did we children understand what went on? Oh yeah, we did. Um, yeah, I would agree with that, um, because as, as you mentioned, and I, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, growing up in Rwanda, I, I, was, I grew up in a country that, under a government that had an interest in uh, dividing people along the ethnic lines. As I said, we even had uh, formal IDs, so when you were born, uh, you eventually have to get, um, you were listed in your father's ID, and when you became of age, you had to get an ID. So whether you went to school or went to look for a job, you always had an ID that said Hutu, Tutsi, or Twa. These were IDs that were actually introduced in Rwanda by the Belgians when the Belgians came to Rwanda and also had interest in dividing people uh, along uh, ethnic lines in order to, uh, to maintain their power. So I grew up in a society and in an environment where children, um, as, long, as, as, as early as you learned your name and your parents' name, you also learned your ethnicity because this was a part of the daily conversation. So um, your neighbors, you knew, and Rwanda is not segregated in terms of like physical segregation. So in each village, you had Hutus and Tutsis living side by side. As I mentioned, I went to school, I went to colleges, I mean, uh, to churches with, with Hutu children, as I did with uh, Tutsi children. And I grew up with the earliest, uh, the stories of the earlier massacres. So I was very well aware, even prior to April of 1994, that I was a Tutsi, and that as a Tutsi and a member of the, uh, the Tutsi ethnic group, I lived in a country where uh, my people were discriminated against, formally, in the government, in schools, uh, where my people had been victims of earlier massacres. But I, I think, again, as I mentioned in my presentation, at that age, I, I always, I heard the history and I heard the stories from my grandmother and from my parents, but I never thought that I would actually ever go through a genocide myself. So when um, April 7th came and the killings began and people were fleeing and I found myself where I was uh, witnessing men, women, and children being murdered, where I would listen as my own our own Hutu government officials, people who you know, we had elected, who had put in office, who come on the radio and say, we were cockroaches. Tutsis were cockroaches. That was a daily uh, message that was being passed on, on the Rwandan radio 24 hours a day. Tutsis are cockroaches that deserve to be exterminated. And hearing all this incitement to kill, seeing the killings around me, I think that although I was nine years old and I didn't you know, yet know what genocide was in its formal definition. I remember that at that time, even at that point, I knew that this was the greatest injustice that human beings could commit uh, to one another, to be forced from your home, to be hunted day and night, to be murdered, not because of anything that you have done, not because of anything that you had a choice in being, but because of the way that you were born. Even at that point, I understood that this was the greatest injustice, even at that age, and this is something that I've um, tried to communicate, you know, subsequently in my lectures, that we have to see genocide as a unique crime, and which can be prevented, as you heard, because it happens in, in a series of events. So I was young, but I was very much aware because of the environment uh, in which I, I, I grew up in. Uh, I actually must admit that my life now, when I look back on my life, I look at it as 
before the war, during the war, and after the war. So before the war, I don't remember any kind of separation, really. Uh, we lived in a farming community in a village on a mountain outside of Srebrenica, and for all I remember, it was a very happy childhood, very close family. I hadn't started school yet, so I, I don't know how that system, I don't have personal memories of how things were in school. Um, when we came to the refugee camps was when things just seemed odd. It was just women and children. I just kept asking my mom where my dad is because I was a six-year-old girl and I'm a very tied to my father just by nature. Um, that did not make sense to me. Um, there were reports that we would get that such and such person was killed during the war. Um, as months turned into years, uh, the things that we had to deal with just kind of separated from the violence, but always thinking your, your, your thoughts are always back there for some reason. You, you, nobody really has any answers for you. And at the same time, you're separated from everyone that you cannot even ask anybody because nobody knows anyways because they don't have TVs. It's not like they were following the news all that much. Whatever letters they got was, were months since they were actually sent. Um, so when we went back to Bosnia in 95, um, and the genocide happened in July of 95, uh, that, those are the times when I really started to realize the gravity of the situation. Um, in Srebrenica, the men and, were, the men and boys were divided and separated um, from women and children who were put on buses and loaded outside of the area. Everybody knew that that basically meant the end for the men and boys. Uh, boys as young as 11 and 12 years old were separated. Uh, as they fit the quote, military, they were of military age. Uh, if that makes any sense in any kind of uh, any kind of definition of that, um, those who uh, those who did not seek refuge in the downtown Srebrenica took to the woods uh, and created a column that basically some of them took months to reach safety and they were shelled for weeks at a time, eating whatever they could find in the forests. Uh, to reach safety. At that point, a lot of them uh, were found by Serbs, um, executed, and dumped in mass graves, which are still being uncovered today. As a matter of fact, just a few weeks ago, there was a new one found with 600 remains, with over 600 remains. Um, so those are the times when these things really started making sense to me, because in our apartment in, um, in Tuzla at that time, we were receiving all of these men from the column and all these refugees, and that's when I really started to ask questions and to make sense of it. And you cannot really make sense of it. Nobody can really offer you an explanation that makes sense. Uh, I don't think anybody can really ever offer you an explanation that makes sense, but particularly cannot digest it down for you as a nine-year-old person that would actually make sense at that time. Um, so you grow up right away. Um, I don't really remember having a childhood. So um, at six, after six years old, we were in refugee camps, which was an abnormal uh, situation. Then after that, genocide hit. And since then, it's been dealing with that and finding the best way to move forward with those experiences. Thank you all so much for those responses. Um, we have a wonderful audience that's been listening so intently. I want to turn it over to see what questions we have from the group. Yes, please. Let me just repeat the question. The, the questioner has noted that the first 
that the two genocides represented in Europe, or that, came, that happened in Europe, had a religious basis. And she's wondering if there was a religious basis to the Rwandan genocide as well. Yeah, no, there was uh, no religious uh, difference. Uh, in Rwanda, growing up, the majority of people were Catholics because of the Belgians' uh, influence, and others were you know, Protestants, Seventh-day Adventists. Um, and Hutus and Tutsis were not divided along religious uh, uh, lines. So I went to churches with, again, Hutus, with Tutsis, and uh, so it was more of ethnic uh, in nature than um, it was religious. And because in Rwanda, I mean, it's not a color difference. Everybody's black. It's not religious, as I said. We speak the same language. We share culture. But the history of the genocide really, um, it's, it's a long history. And it began with uh, the, uh, the arrival of the Belgians, who began um, distributing these ID cards and uh, saying that Tutsis were foreigners who had come from Ethiopia, another part of Africa, and came to Rwanda, that they were, so I grew up with this history that Tutsis, my ethnic group, were foreigners, were not true Rwandan. Uh, but today, in post-genocide Rwanda, it's been 21 years, and the government is uh, now struggling to teach uh, a different history. Uh, because a lot of the history that was taught to myself and to the other children growing up in Rwanda was a history that was constructed by people who had interest in, in dividing people rather than bringing people together. Because when you go to Rwanda now, Hutus and Tutsis, as, as I said, we share more uh, and we're more alike than we're different. But because we had governments that were always had a vested interest in dividing people and monopolizing people, uh, power um, on, uh, along ethnic uh, lines, children were taught to see their neighbor as, 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 uh, as their enemy. But uh, the short answer to your question, again, is that it's more of an ethnic difference. Uh, it's not, there's no religious uh, difference. between the two groups, and that uh, nowadays the government is trying to change the history. I'm wondering how successful that's been since people were brought up with generations of hatred. How successful that's been, and what is the situation of uh, the, uh, ethnic groups today in Rwanda? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I didn't say that there's no basic difference. There were some differences. I mentioned that we, sh we have more similarities than differences. So histor historically, for example, if you go back, you know, there were differences in a way of life. You know, Tutsis were mainly cow herders, nomadic people. Hutus were uh, involved in, 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 uh, in agriculture. So there was a difference in a, in a way of life. There were some differences, but again, more similarities. Uh, than their differences. So the post-genocide government uh, has now been um, trying to create a larger identity of letting people understand that yes, we are Hutus, we are Tutsis, we are Twas, but we are also Rwandans, and we share a country name uh, called Rwanda. But because, as you can imagine, because we've lived through these decades of uh, indoctrination and teaching anti-Tutsi propaganda and portraying Tutsis as foreigners, as the enemies, as you can imagine, this type of re-education is a process that's going to, to take a long time. Uh, but the good news is that we do have a government uh, that is committed uh, to that uh, type of teaching and to a peaceful coexistence uh, between Hutus and Tutsis. Now, with everyday uh, neighbors and people in the villages, they are people who are committed, who share the same commitment, right, to peaceful coexistence. But you also have people who still have the idea, who still hold the ideology of genocide. Uh, when you go to Rwanda and speak to some of the people who participated in the killings, and there were thousands, some of them have confessed and recognized that what they did was wrong, but there are some who still believe that they, what they did was okay, that it was their duty, and that Tutsis are cockroaches. So the, the ideology and the, the mindset varies from person to person, but at least for the first time we have a government that has interest in bringing people together as opposed to separating them 
along ethnic lines. And I think if we can continue to have that type of a government, then we're in good situation. God forbid we have a government that again resorts to, you know, playing the ethnic card, then we are, we are in trouble. And I know Dan has made a number of trips to Rwanda, so he can uh, perhaps share a little bit about that as well. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a complicated question. Um, and Rwanda is quite different from the example of the Holocaust, where um, after the war in Rwanda, most people went back to their same old homes. Mm -hmm. And they lived next door to the same people they had grown up with prior to the genocide, only now they knew something different about each other. And the challenge in Rwanda is different, I think, than the other cases because of that. And the struggle to create, to connect to a pre-colonial history and to draw a straight line from the pre-colonial period to the present period because that model worked better for Rwanda is um, almost unim unimaginable, the str how, how, how difficult it is. Yeah. And yet 20 years of post-genocide reconstruction has made tremendous strides that you can perceive very palpably uh, when you're there. Um, we have so many students here. I just wonder if we can maybe open it up. I know sometimes as a student you're shy. You feel like the questions should come from people who know more than you. I promise you everyone feels the same way. So I just want to give a minute and a minute of space for a student to ask a question. All right, please. Could one classify the events occurring in Syria today I'd love to hear from the panel on that. The question was, can we consider the events that are happening today in Syria as a genocide? I would say yes. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> I, say, I would say yes, it is a genocide. Anyone else want to chime in? I mean, you know, it, has, it hasn't been formally, um, you know, categorized as a genocide. And this is also a problem because the word genocide is very political, as we all know it. And many times, including when my own people were being killed uh, in 1994, it took months for the nature of the killings to be described as a genocide. It was for weeks described as civil war, tribal killings, because the UN Security Council knew that if they used the word genocide, they had a legal obligation to intervene. So because there is that legal obligation on the part of the Security Council to stop a genocide, you will find that many of modern uh, cases, what's happening now in Syria, what's happening now in Burundi, the neighboring of, of, of Rwanda, people refrain often from using that, 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 um, that word. But I, I think what is clear is that people are being targeted along ethnic lines and along religious lines. And for me, it shouldn't even have to be genocide for people to intervene. The, play, the time to intervene is now. Because as, as we all have said, it's you know, the, the ultimate massacre, that's the worst one, but the time to intervene is one. So I, won't, I don't think I want to say, it, it's, it, it, it's relevant whether it's a genocide, to be honest. But what we, what we all agree on is that people are being targeted because they are opposed to the government or because of they are Christians or because of you know, their different ethnic group. And that, that is not OK. And that's something that uh, requires the attention of all of us. And I know myself and all of us, I'm sure, have been very vocal in speaking about Syria. I'm, speaking, I'm being very vocal about what is going on in uh, my own neighbor, Burundi, where people are also being targeted. Uh, Burundi is a neighboring country to Rwanda that has uh, the same ethnic demographics as Rwanda, Hutus and Tutsis. And there, even now, people are being targeted as we speak. So um, uh, I think that it's very important for us to realize as, as global citizens that when we hear of people being targeted because of who they are and because of what they believe, we shouldn't wait for the UN Security Council to call it a genocide before we start rallying and trying to get them to, to act. Yes, absolutely. I love these. Unfortunately, sometimes these terms do have a political connotation to them, and our willingness to act or just kind of stand on the sidelines is very dependent on what kind of category we put, we put a particular conflict in. Um, the word genocide 
does carry obligations with it, and you will find that unfortunately, sometimes our international community just does not want to get involved, um, and we use certain terms to placate ourselves in a way. Syria is a particular example where we have millions of refugees fleeing to save their lives, and 90% of media is calling them migrants, and that's a very intentional choice that they are making, because the moment you call them refugees, mm -hmm. that puts the obligation on the international community to take care of them. Yeah. And if they're migrants, they're just going from one country to another looking for better lives, uh, perhaps for economic reasons, which all we have a right to do, but when you're a refugee, that means you're forced out of your home, not by choice, and international community does have a, an obligation to protect you. And these kinds of terms are very deliberate in why they do it, and they're usually actually state-sanctioned media actions that are just going around all, or all around the world. Because of the things that are happening in Burundi, in, in Sudan, and, and, and ISIS, Iraq, and yeah. taking the word barbarism and to, to me, blows, do you ever despair that the problem will never be did everyone hear the question? Yeah. In the face of the ongoing human unfolding catastrophes in Burundi and Sudan, um, and uh, the images we see daily from ISIS, um, uh, do these survivors ever despair that uh, there's, a, there's a solution? That one day, not to put words in your mouth, but that, that never again can, can actually uh, ha have some meaning one day? Do they despair about that? I think maybe the first thing the world needs to do is stop hating and setting one group up against the other. Unless we do that, I don't think there is a resolution. Um, no, I, I think, I mean, I think for me, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely, um, it's very easy to get overwhelmed and paralyzed uh, when we get up and we watch the news or read the New York Times, because like you said, we're not just talking about one particular place, we're talking about places all over the world on different continents, whether it's Syria, whether it's ISIS in Iraq, whether it's Burundi, whether it's Sudan, whether it's DRC. And, um, one can easily become paralyzed. Where do you even begin? But I, I think that uh, for me personally, um, you know, despairing and being paralyzed is not an option. So if anything, uh, seeing these things um, give me even more energy and motivates me to do even more. Uh, because at the end of the day, I truly do believe that genocide as a crime can be prevented. Because as I mentioned, as we all mentioned, people don't get up one day and they pick up machetes and they attack their neighbors. It begins with the propaganda, the dehumanization, the monopolization of power along ethnic and religious lines. So that I think that for me, uh, part of my work with as an individual and now with the Genocide Survivors Foundation has really been focused on prevention. That if, as Hannah said, we can educate people about the dangers of hate and the dangers of intolerance, religious, ethnic, racial intolerance, then we are doing more to move the world toward uh, the never again um, that, was, that was promised. But in cases where prevention fails and we are talking about intervention, I do think that all of us also cannot afford to be paralyzed and to be overwhelmed and to despair. We have to, to stand up and to speak loudly and to call on our, our leaders, local leaders, our national leaders, uh, to get more involved. So I, I, I agree with you. There are mornings when I get up and I I just can't believe what I'm reading. I'm like, when are we going to learn? Is enough is enough. But um, I try to have that push me to, to do more and to keep speaking and mobilizing people. Um, you know, I think today we have a tendency to call it ethnic cleansing rather than genocide. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure that I decided to speak in the last question. Uh, no problem. Um, 
I, I'm not paralyzed because just the alternative is just unacceptable. So there just cannot be that we accept a world where that is okay. What I'm most uh, concerned about actually is our renewed ways of trying to cr create an other. We're always looking for some kind of differences between each other and I think the more we kind of go into this vastly connected world, the easier that gets. There's always somebody else out there. There's always, it doesn't even have to be a religious uh, or ethnic, or as you, we see in the Rwandan example. We keep creating these examples of we, there is an other, whether that's a racial um, difference that we are creating. Sometimes I look around in the situation in the US and we have the xenophobic behaviors that really are concerning me. Um, and I, 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 I don't, that is, those are the kinds of things that really do, uh, do frustrate and concern uh, in this day and age. Violence, of course, uh, is the last step, but it's these little nuances that we kind of, uh, choose to ignore in the beginning that can really spread quickly and they can turn into violence quickly. I see, I see a lot of hands go up, but unfortunately we've reached the end of our time. Um, student one student question, we definitely have time, please. <laughs> After you guys pointed the way how the propaganda was, it plays a, a very important role in all these genocide amendments. Out of your experience and you, the way you guys see the, the light in these days, why do I think about the media, the media industry, and are you comfortable about that? Or you have to think to complain about the media? Let me just restate the question briefly. Um, having, in each of your genocides, seen the very damaging role of the media in being the communicators of the propaganda, the dehumanizing propaganda that mobilized the masses to the call to genocide, uh, what do you think about uh, today's media and the way today's media covers events and, um, yeah. It depends what station you are listening to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sure. Sure. I mean, in Germany, we experience propaganda, right? State-ordered propaganda. And it can be a terrible animal, as we all saw. So we have to be very careful what we listen to what we believe or what we don't believe. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as, as one, the media can be used, you know, um, constructively or it can be used as a destructive force. In the Holocaust, Rwanda, Bosnia, I mean, it's, it's across the board. Um, but one thing that I, I can say about, so media is important, but I do think that, you know, today's media and our own media, local media, national media, I think there's a need to hold um, our media stations more accountable uh, for what they report or do not report, even most importantly. Because, for example, you know, I subscribe to CNN News, and I always get this um, breaking news, CNN breaking news in my email. And it's rarely ever about Syria. It's rarely ever about Burundi. It's rarely ever about ISIS. The CNN breaking news is generally about movie stars in Hollywood, right? Who broke up with who, who's sleeping with who, who's not sleeping with who. I mean, you know the story. So I do think that there is a need to hold our media accountable in reporting stories that need to be reported on and in trying to join those individuals and Holocaust centers and terrorist centers in sounding the alarm when the alarm need to be sounded uh, whether we're talking about Syria or Burundi right now. So that accountability piece for me is very important and I think that that's one way all of us, because at the end of the day, if we're not 
receptive to what we are being fed, then we'll be, you know, the media stations will be forced to report on things that we care about. So we do need to, that's one way that we really can participate in, in making sure that um, the information that we do need to receive, uh, we receive it and we receive it in, in a timely fashion. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sorry to, to, to cut it off. I know that people have to leave and I don't want, I think that our speakers are gonna be available to stay and have informal conversations for a few minutes. But I really just wanted, before people had to go, to take the time as, as an entire group to thank these three remarkable women for their sharing their story. And I wanna thank you all for coming out on a drizzly night to hear them and to share it with us. Um, please grab programs for other events and I look forward to seeing you all again soon.